I believe the message there is we're fucked. <laughs> I am not a scientist, but I, I believe that's the Sounds message. like we're in trouble, though, I, I think. I think they're big asteroids. Yeah, big yeah. ones, yeah. 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 Anyway, um, we wanted to have Nathan come out today because that was a really interesting story in the New York Times, and I called him and I said, can you just come and talk about what you did there? And it was great because he really, you know, he, he gave a, a, a speech many, many years about tsunamis in the ocean, which everyone sort of ridiculed, and he turned out to be right. So Yeah, he's given speeches about Hawaii splitting in half and, yes, and how dinosaurs like managed to have sex. Yeah, so we whatever. thought it was kind of an interesting, especially given our next guest. And... We're really pleased to have him here. I've been driving him crazy to come. I like bother him at parties. I, How does that make him different than anyone else? And nobody. But I, I really bother Elon a lot. Um, but we had him a couple of years ago um, at the All Things D conference. It was one of our biggest, best yeah, interviews. Yeah, great. Um, there it was great right now to bookend him with uh, Jeff Bezos and him in terms of visionaries and the internet. And I think a lot of people think that of Elon. He's doing some very exciting and substantive um, things with both of his companies, SpaceX and Tesla. And so, without further ado, Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Elon, let me start by saying we're very glad you're here safe and sound. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, of course, I had to start for a bit late. I was. Uh, uh, flying, I flew here with the landing gear down because it was like some kind of landing gear issue. Landing gear was stuck? There's some kind of warning light. Uh, and my pilot said that if they were attracted to the landing gear, it may not go back down again. So, I thought, so this probably happens, best to leave it down. This even happens to you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, we're gear. happy to wait for you, and we're glad you got here safe. Well, thanks for having um, me. It's great to see you guys. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. You kept your promise, which was nice. Of course. I think you were drunk when you promised me, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I'll take it. So, you know, in the couple of years since you've come, you've done some astonishing things in, in terms of, of substantive stuff with, your, with both your companies. Um, let's start talking about space and what you've been doing there. Um, obviously, you've had some success uh, landing, the, landing the rocket. You've had, you know, you've done a bunch of other things that where people thought you weren't going to be successful. Talk a little bit about sort of the progress you think you've made with SpaceX. Sure. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things where I, I think I, I didn't think we'd be successful. Um, so the, the um, probably, and the most significant thing is being able to land an, an, an orbit class rocket, uh, Bruce stage, um, and uh, and bring it both back to Cape Canaveral, uh, land on land, and be able to land. On a drone ship out in the ocean, um, the um, it, it, there is a bit of an education process that's needed to understand orbital dynamics um, because a lot of people can, are confused of like why the heck are you landing a ship, uh, landing a rocket in a on a ship in the ocean? That seems pretty inconvenient, um, and the, the reason is because that uh, going up and staying up is actually about velocity horizontal to the Earth's surface. So um, there's a huge difference between space and, or space and, or, and orbit. Like space, you could think of as like, say, being the international waters boundary for the Pacific Ocean. Like if you go, you know, uh, 100 miles offshore, you're technically out of yes. coastal waters. Now you're in the Pacific. Right. So it's like technically you're in the Pacific. But, but, it's, but orbit is like circumnavigating the globe. Right. It, it's, it's a really giant difference. And the, the, the reason that things go up and stay up is because you're, you're zooming around the Earth so fast that your outward radial acceleration is equal to the inward acceleration of gravity. And so those balance out, and you have a net zero gravity. So when you see the space station, the thing that's a little, little sort of um, counterintuitive is that the space station is actually zooming around the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour. Even though it seems like it just... It seems really still, you know, but it's moving really, really fast. Um, I mean, to put that into perspective, um, a bullet from a 45 um, gun, you know, handgun, um, is, 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 is uh, just below the speed of sound. So the space station is going more than 25 times faster than that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And that's what's needed, actually, to go up and stay up. Um, and that's why, that's why the, there's the term escape velocity, not right. escape altitude. There's no such thing as an escape altitude. There's only an escape velocity. You need to be a certain speed to escape the gravity of the Earth. Yeah, you can think of gravity as kind of a funnel in space-time. Um, so uh, 
it, it, think of it like a coin funnel. Like it's it really it's, it's very much like that in, in you know, but it's obviously a, sort of a four-dimensional coin funnel. But uh, if, if you if you spin a spin a marble or a coin on a coin funnel, the it, it, when it's when it's far out, it sort of spins slowly, and then as it gets closer, it spins faster and faster. And if you want, if you want, if you were to start at the bottom of the coin funnel and you wanted to 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 to, to exit, you'd spin it horizontally, and, and it would it would spin out, and 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 that's really how you how you get to orbit. Um, yeah. So, so how does the that gravity well is like why, a funnel. Why you want to land on the on a ship in the ocean? Because. Um, in order to get to orbit, you, all that matters is your horizontal velocity. Your altitude is, doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, in fact, the, the, um, the force of gravity at, uh, say, uh, the sort of nominal um, boundary of space, 100 kilometers, is almost exactly the same as it is on the surface of the Earth. Hmm. Um, it's, like if it's a few percent lower than, than the surface of the Earth. Um, uh, so in, in order to go up and stay up, the only thing that matters is how fast are you going horizontal to the Earth's surface. So you have that outward radial acceleration, or think of it like maybe like tether ball or something like that. It's really that outward acceleration is the thing that matters. Um, and so when the rocket is going to orbit, um, the only reason it's going up is to get out of the thick part of the atmosphere. Because at, at high velocity, the atmosphere is thick as molasses. Um, and so it goes up very briefly, but if you look at a long exposure, of the, the rocket's uh, trajectory, you'll see it, it goes up, but immediately curves over and starts going horizontal. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, um, at, at, the, at the point at which the, uh, the, uh, the, at the point at which the stages separate, those two stages, um, the, the primary boost stage, which is the most expensive part of the rocket, the point at which that, st that staging occurs uh, can be um, as high as uh, Mach 10. Um, but it's, it's, so it's going away from the launch site at 10 times the speed of sound. So in, in order to get back to the launch site, you would have to have enough uh, nice. fuel and oxygen to reverse out that velocity and, and, and boost back all the way to the launch site. Uh, and you just don't have, the physics of it don't really allow you to have that much. It's, it's not about saving money on fuel or anything. It's just physically impossible. Um, so, um, because another sort of thing about uh, if, you're, if you're in space is that there's nothing to react against. So, like, whereas an aircraft can, can circle very easily because it's reacting against air, in vacuum there's nothing to react against. So the only way to go back the other direction is to apply just as much energy as it took you to go, it, if you want to go backwards, you have to apply just as much energy as it took you to go forwards. Mm -hmm. In fact, well, twice as much, really, because you've got to zero it out, and then you've got to. So you've yeah. got to land elsewhere. Yeah. So bottom line is this thing is zinging out to zinging out to so, sea at super at ten times so faster than a bullet. It may well be over the ocean because the ocean covers most of the. Oh, it's 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 actually at the point of separation. It's not that far away. It's maybe a hundred kilometers away from the, the launch site, but it is going like hell in the opposite, you know, away from the launch site. So the 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 only way to really land it is to have it continue on that arc, that ballistic arc, and then land far out to sea on a ship that's, that's pre-positioned to a particular uh, latitude and longitude, very, very precise, to within about a meter. Um, and then the, the rocket will um, then go from vacuum through rarefied air at hypersonic velocity. Uh, um, you have to use um, nitrogen jets to control the um, the attitude and position. And then um, as it starts to encounter uh, the air, um, we use um, grid fins, because grid fins uh, look like sort of like a waffle. Um, they, they work quite well across a wide regime from both very high velocity um, hypersonics through supersonic, transonic, and subsonic. Um, so it's hard, to, it's, it's hard to have aerosurfaces that work well across that entire regime. And then, uh, so once the air, air forces become high, it uses the, um, the four grid fins to, to sort of control its attitude. To and, land itself. Yeah, it's, it's, controlling, it's, it's, it's controlling pitch, yaw, and roll with, with the grid fins. Um, and, uh, and then once, and th those grid fins will then 
position it to where it's fairly close to the ship, and then it will light, in this case, three of the nine engines to arrest the velocity and then drop to one engine for precision right before landing. Right, okay. So, super so that was a, hard. maybe a bit of so a long wait, explanation. No, but, okay, <laughs> what we're going to get to is that's super fucking hard. There's a video. So, so why, video. why is that important? Why has that, this moment been important for you? Um, well, so in order to reuse the the boost stage, which is right. about 70% of the cost of the rocket. So that, Wh which cost is that? How much is that? Um, well, I mean, it's sort of on the order of 30 to $35 million. Right, so you want to save that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I try to I tell my team, it's like, imagine there was a pallet of cash right. that was plummeting through the atmosphere, <laughs> <laughs> and it was going to burn up and smash into tiny pieces. Would you try to save it? Right, right, right. Probably yes. Yes, okay. Yeah, that uh, sounds like a good idea. Right, okay. Uh-huh. Um, so, so, yeah, so we, 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 we want to get it back. Right. And that way, um, we don't have to make another one. Right. Um, and I think it's quite tragic if rockets like, get smashed into tiny pieces and land so the bottom of the ocean. So can I ask you a question? We, we've, been in, we've been going to space for, uh, what, 50 years or something like that? Yeah. Nobody, until you started doing this and Jeff Bezos' company has done it, uh, the government never no, sort like of saved the things, rockets. Yeah. They never saved the pallet of cash. Why not? And the Russians didn't either. I mean, what was the um, deal there? Yeah, I mean, there was some attempt uh, made to do that with the, the space shuttle, but there was no um, return. It's the first time that, that a, a rocket boost has returned to launch site right. um, from an orbital mission, and, and certainly the first time that there's been a, a landing on a ship out But the sea. regular rockets that went up that weren't designed like planes never tried to do this. Right. Um, the plane thing is not, not a good idea in my view. Um, the, so so the, the, the plane, um, and the, the reason I think is, like intuitively it seems like a plane should work, but, but actually if you, if you consider that really every mode of transport has a design that is appropriate to its medium. Um, and if you're in space, um, wings are not very useful because mm -hmm. um, there's no air. Mm -hmm. uh. um, and, and, and then if you want to go somewhere other than Earth, there's also no runways. Uh -huh. So this is, these are important considerations. Um, so that's why when they went to the moon, they used propulsive landing. Right, but what I'm saying was when they built the space shuttle, it sort of was like a, looked like a kind of bulbous I think that plane. appealed to Congress, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it went cool, that's cool. Yeah, it looked so like can, an airplane. Can you explain the, okay. the you know, Jeff, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Good one. Jeff Bezos was here last night and I asked him, what's the difference between what you're doing and what Elon Musk is doing? And he said, well, I think we have I think he used the word like-minded in the general sense of it, and then he went on to explain some differences. Do you, and then he, but he talked about, and correct me if I'm misquoting him, but I think he was saying, uh, we're, this is all about laying the foundations of being able to do greater things by getting the basic infrastructure of being able to reuse these rockets down right. Do you, is that correct? Do you have a similar starting point from him and your thinking I think, process? I, I, mean, I think there's certainly some similarities of opinion. Um, I think both uh, Jeff and I believe that it's important for the future to be a space-faring civilization um, and out there, uh, ultimately be out there among the stars. And I think that's the, that's the exciting, inspiring future that I think, I think certainly people in this room want. And any, anyone well, particularly could. after seeing that the asteroids are going to destroy this yeah. planet. I mean, um, I mean, I don't view it as, um, you know, we want, we, I mean, I think, I think what, when I say, you know, multi-planet species, like, that's really what we want to be. It's not like, you know, still being a single-planet species, but moving planets. It's, uh, it's really being a multi-planet species um, and having civilization and life as we know it extend beyond Earth to the rest of the solar system and ultimately to other star systems. Um, I think that's the thing, that, that's, the, that's the future that's exciting and inspiring, and I think that's what, you know, I think, you know, you need kind of you need things like that to make to 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 be glad to wake up in the morning. You know, like life, life life can't be just about solving problems. Like there have to be things that are inspiring and exciting that make you glad to be alive. 
So what, in the immediate time frame, what is, what is your goal for SpaceX now that you've done this, which is a huge accomplishment? What is the plan for you in the immediate time and then the longer range? Sure. So, the, um, so we plan to refly uh, one of the landed um, rocket boosters, hopefully in about uh, two or three months, something like that. Um, and um, and then that, that so that'll be an important milestone. Um, so far, the, the, the stages are looking like quite quite good, uh, even though they come through through quite. There's a really difficult entry reentry situation, um, but they're they're looking in, like they're in, they're in good shape. Um, and we now have four of them, um, so we want to start reflying them, um, you know, towards the end of summer, um, and then uh, hopefully. By the end of this year, we'll be launching Falcon Heavy, uh, which will, will be the, um, the most powerful rocket uh, in the world by more than a factor of two. Mm -hmm. So Falcon Heavy is, will be on the order of five million pounds of thrust on liftoff, which is about two-thirds the size of a Saturn V. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's That's quite... the rocket that took the astronauts to the moon. Right, right exactly. So, in fact, we're launching from the, same, from the same pad. from Very same pad? From the Apollo 11 pad. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. So uh, you, oh, you're hoping I, to yeah. launch that Falcon Heavy by the end of this year, you said? Yeah, that's, that's our aspiration. Is that, now that's somewhat of a delay from when you first hoped to launch it, right? Uh, yeah, um, but uh, the, the, I mean, it's not like we had a lot of pressing customers who wanted us to launch it. Uh -huh. um, okay. <laughs> so the, uh, in fact, the first launch will, will not have any operational satellites. It'll be a demonstration launch. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the first operational flights where customers actually want us to launch it are next year. Um, you know, whereas there's, there's a lot of customers who want us to launch uh, Falcon 9. Um, so about, about a quarter of our, launch, of our flights are for, uh, for NASA, um, but three quarters are for uh, commercial satellites, like broadcast and communication satellites, um, or science missions for other countries. Um, and um, and, and there's, just, there's quite, a big, quite a backlog. And we, ha we had an issue with the rocket last year, so that um, put about a six month hole in our schedule. So we're sort of backlogged on, on our launches and we're trying to get them out as, as, as quickly as we, as we can um, and you know, service, you know, service our customers. The, the, uh, so we're, the launches will take place you know, every two to four weeks. So it's quite a, quite a high launch cadence. That's a much faster cadence than NASA had, right? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it'll be more launches than any, anything else in the world. Um, so more than Russia, more than Europe, more than well, more than China by next year, certainly. And largely to deliver customers' satellites. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, there's a lot of broadcast and communication satellites that are going to geosynchronous orbit. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then there's, we're, we're, we'll also be launching the new uh, Iridium constellation. Mm -hmm. So that Iridium's got a next generation mm -hmm. uh, constellation of uh, satellites, I think 60 or 70 satellites, quite, you know, decent sized satellites. Of, that, that'll be like many orders of magnitude improvement over the current radium system. So we'll be able to have global broadband. Um, so that, that'll be a whole bunch of launches. And um, yeah, and then, and then next year we'll be flying um, Dragon version two, which is the one that's capable of taking up to seven astronauts to the space station. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, Dra Dragon two really is, it's a propulsive lander as well. Um, and It'll be the, uh, it's, it's, it's intended to carry astronauts to the space station, but it's also capable of being a general science delivery platform to anywhere in the solar system. So, um, so where are you going with it? Well, we're going we're, we're to send one to Mars in 2018. Okay. Now, let's no, wait, 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 2018, 2018, that's for sure. Yeah, a couple of years. A couple of years. Okay. Now, will you be on that flight? No. This you is, have talked about this. You said you don't want it. You want to die on Mars, just not on landing, right? Is that correct? Well, I mean, I think if you're going to choose a place to die, then Mars is probably, you know, not a bad choice. All right. Um, <laughs> but you're not it's, ready. It's, to... some, it's not some sort of Martian death wish or something. Um, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I mean, if you're going to be born on Earth, die on Mars. So sending this up to Mars, 2018. <laughs> right. Sending this up to Mars, 2018. When will someone like you get there? from your plans? Sure, so, so the 2018 mission would be um, our Dra Dragon version two. Right. Um, and that, um, 
I wouldn't recommend traveling to Mars in, in that because the, the trip for Dragon would be on the order of six months. Mm -hmm. It's a long time to spend in an SUV, I think. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's, you know, it can be done, can be done, but not, not, probably not ideal. Um, and it also doesn't have the capability of getting back to Earth. Right. Um, that's, <laughs> that seems more important than the space. So, yeah, we can put that in the, in the fine print, you know. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Like it's, it's like the side effects in a yeah. drug ad. By you, the way. We yeah. cannot get back to Earth. Yeah. Yeah, we saw the movie. We yeah. saw what happened. He got back. Yeah. He got, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was good. I, I actually enjoyed the movie. Um, so... Do you think he could have gotten back like that? Was that plausible? Well, I thought there was some... You know, connection. It was. It was most. It was like eighty percent scientifically correct. Um, okay. There did connect a series of improbable events. So Such as. Say. Well, I mean, I don't think you can sort of just uh, take off from Mars um, on an unguided rocket, really, and and then prick your finger on the spacesuit and navigate to a to a spaceship. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Not 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 impossible. Just extremely unlikely. <laughs> So the Sandra but if you're, movie. But if work. you're Matt Damon, maybe? Maybe. You have some mad skills, <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> so, so, so when will people like yourself get there? And I assume you'll be first in line for that. Yeah, so uh, later this year in September at the um, IAC, which is the big uh, sort of world space conference, industry space conference, I'm going to be presenting the, uh, the architecture for Mars colonization. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what really matters is being able to transport uh, large numbers of people and um, ultimately right. millions of tons of cargo to Mars. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and that's what's necessary in order to create a self-sustaining, uh, and, 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 and a, a, not only really self-sustaining, but a, gro a growing uh, city on Mars. I'm curious, have you been to space yet? No. Why? I mean, you could just go up, right, for a little bit or not? Um, I could, I suppose, yeah. yeah. Why haven't you? Like I'm walked around the moon some or point. something? Or? Yeah, well, yeah, I probably will. Will you do a moon test well. before you go to Mars? Um, yeah, I mean, probably, probably, I don't know, go to orbit in four or five years or something like that. But yeah. again, space and orbit are very different things. Yeah. But on the Mars thing, would you send up two or three, whether it's you or not? I, I kind of would prefer it if you tried it, frankly. But sure. um, because. It would be exciting, but um, would you send up some, peop some people before you do this whole architecture for colonizing Mars, just a handful of people to kind of well, see what... I mean, the, the basic game plan is like, we're, we're going to uh, send um, a mission to Mars with every Mars opportunity from 2018 onwards. So, and they occur approximately every 26 months. So, um, you know, we, we're, establish we're establishing cargo flights to Mars. That people, that people can count on uh, for, for cargo. Um, and it's like I said, the, the, the Earth-Mars orbital rendezvous is only every 26 months. So there's right. one in 2018, there'll be another one in 2020. Um, and I think if things go according to plan, we should be able to, uh, we should be able to launch people probably in 2024 with arrival in 2025. Soon. Is that is that a, a more certain schedule than United Airlines? <laughs> well, um, I don't know. Um, well, there's certainly some United uncertainties Airlines associated with that. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, to, to, to to launch the first um, of the Mars and, and colonial you, transport system. I, I want to get back to what you say. Big, bigger than big. Saturn V. Yes. Tw twice as big, or what? September. I'll tell you. Not going to say anything till September. Come on. It's very big. Come on. Has to be very big. I. It, how big is very big? So big. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, do you think we should abandon the Earth at some no. point? No. No. I, no. I think that's great. But you have said things. <laughs> Why would we abandon Earth? It's really nice here. You've yeah. said things about we may have to abandon the Earth, so it's good to have a Plan B. You've no, said I that haven't. before. No, that was. That's, I think that's maybe, maybe, yeah, I don't know, but it wasn't me. Um, All right, okay. It <laughs> wasn't me, like Shaggy. You know. right. uh, um, so let's move to things on this earth. Let's move to uh, Hyperloop, Tesla, uh, other things. But let's talk about Tesla first. Sure. Um, 
where do you feel like the company is at at this point? And there's been lots of activity in self-driving cars, in autonomous, semi-autonomous. How do you look at how everybody's jumped in? Google, Apple, others, um, and all the car manufacturers. Um, yeah, I mean, there have been so many announcements of like autonomous EV startups. I'm waiting for my mom to announce one. Okay. Um, it's like, mom, you too. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a lot. So, um, yeah, I mean, in in yeah, in in the U.S. alone, there are there are four, I think maybe five, China-funded EV startups. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, at, at the billion dollar plus level, like serious funding, um, and there's a bunch of startups, and then of course the you know the car industry as a whole seems to be moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, Volkswagen just I think announced a, a huge battery factory that they're going to yeah. build, um, and I think these are all good. You know, it's good it's good for um, the industry to be moving towards sustainable transport as as quickly as possible. Um, we open sourced our patents to try to be helpful in that regard. And um, yeah, so it's it's encouraging to see all this activity. Um, f from a Tesla standpoint, you know, we just try to, we want to take a set of actions that are uh, likely to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. Um, so um, scale up production as fast as we can. So we accelerated plans for the Model Three by two years. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we want to try to get to, which is an aggressive schedule, but I think achievable. Um, and, um, and there may be a million cars a year by 2020. Um, and, um, you know, I, I can see, it, like, I think, a pretty clear path to get there. Uh, autonomy is obviously extremely important. Uh, it's, people are going to want, want autonomy. It's going to be odd to have a car without autonomy in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, so th I think that's so what, what, we're what you, scaling up. How do you rushing. look at how do you look at the, all these efforts? Not your mother, but yeah, but, my mom's. Uh, yeah, she's she's right. not going to do it. She may do a <laughs> rocket situation, but yeah. um, how do you look at each of them? Let's go through them. What Google is doing? How do you assess what they're doing when you're looking at it? Because there'll be competitors at some point. These are all um, eventual competitors. Well, uh, you know, I think what what Google's. I mean, Google's done a great job of showing the potential of autonomous transport. Right. Um, but they're, they're, not a, they're not a car company, so they would potentially you know, license their technology to other car companies. And I think they announced something with uh, Fiat. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, I wouldn't say you know, Google's a competitor um, because they, they're not a car company. They, we would compete with somebody perhaps with their license technology. Um, yeah, that, that'll be more direct. That'll be more direct? Yeah. You can tell that by the hiring pattern and yeah, yeah, that absolutely. kind of stuff. Yeah. So what do you? Okay, so they're going to be more direct. How Tesla. do you assess it? Um, I mean, I, I say like you know, I, I I think it's great that they're doing this, and um, I, um, you know, I hope they I hope it works out. <laughs> <laughs> what's What's the time frame for them? Do you think? Um, I don't know. I mean. Um, I, I think they should have uh, um, embarked upon this project sooner, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that, uh, um, but I don't know. I don't know when. They, I mean, they have, you know, they don't share with me the details of their mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. production plans. But um, I, I, I don't think it's going to be. I don't think they'll be in volume production sooner than maybe 2020. That would be like the soonest. And that's, is that too late? When you say they should have embarked sooner, is, tw is that because 2020 would be too late to stop you or beat you or compete with you or what? No, it's just like it's a missed opportunity. It's just a, that they, it's, it's. Um, It'll be over by 2020? No, no, it's, not, it's, not, it's just like it's, it's, it's a couple of years. I think they'll, they'll probably make a good car and uh, probably be successful. The car industry is very big, so it's not as though there's, um, you know, one company to the exclusion of others. Um, I mean, there's like a dozen car companies in the world of, of, of significance. So, uh, and the, the most that any company has is approximately 10% market share. So it's, it's not like, um, you know, somebody comes up with a car and they're suddenly like, they kill everyone else. It's not, not that way. 
Um, and, and the sheer scale of automotive manufacturing is, is, is just, it's hard to appreciate until you see the plants. I mean, they're gigantic. Yeah, like the industrial, I have seen the plants. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the sheer size of the industrial infrastructure is, is staggering. Not just the assembly plant, but everything else that goes. Yeah, the supply chain, exactly. The assembly plant is just a the little engine tip plant. of the iceberg, the, really. Mm -hmm. yeah, the the assembly plant is literally tip of the iceberg. Phenomenal. The, the supply chain is, um, you know, once you go to tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers, mm -hmm. um, that's probably an order of magnitude more uh, so, than the, so, okay, than so, the final assembly. So you think Google will not be a competitor, Apple probably will be a direct competitor. Yeah, yeah, sure. What about the car companies? The, the, yeah, the I think they will, they'll all be competitors, yeah, sure. Who do you see out there that has done a nice job so far? Mercedes or? GM of, or, of, of what? Of a competitive car. Of the incumbents. Um, potentially competitive car, I guess. I mean, I don't think anyone's far. Mm -hmm. I mean, you tell me if, I'm, if you disagree, um, but uh, I don't think yet that any of them have made a great electric car. Okay. They, you know, presumably will continue to improve on what they've done so far, and, and then at some point they may make a car that's, that, that's uh, you know, but that's a great car, but no, they haven't done that yet. Can I ask you about batteries for a second? Uh, yeah, sure. So you're building this gigafactory, right? You've, it's built. It's, well, it's not completely built. But, okay, but it, part but of it's up and running. A big running. chunk of it's built, yeah. Part of it's, it's up and running. It's a really gigantic thing. It's, like, when the gigafactory's done, it'll be the largest footprint building of any kind in the world. Of any kind, not just factories, it literally of any kind. What is kind. this? The largest rocket, the largest <laughs> building. I mean,. It, well, I mean, I think this, it's not scale for scale's sake. It's just like if you say, well, we want to accomplish these goals, then, um, then you kind of have to be, make a big thing. So, okay. Um, <laughs> You've got this big thing. It's this big, giant building. Right. Yeah. It's going to make batteries. The batteries it's going to make are lithium. Yeah, we're going to have an opening. Well, it's not technically an opening party since it's been operating for a little while, but we're going to have a party soon. You guys maybe want to come. Okay. We can come? All right, yeah, good. Sure. We'll come to the can battery they, party. It's pretty, but they can't I, I come. Love it's worth seeing. This they is can't like, come, right? Just this this yeah. is crazy. No. <laughs> this is like an alien dreadnought. It's really okay. nutty. Because I love a battery party. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> right, right, but, 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 but talk but about where it's going. Are these lithium-ion batteries? Yeah, yeah, sure. So they're the same batteries that's in no. our phone? No. no. <laughs> explain. Please explain. Yeah, so, so lithium... You, have you made a, a battery breakthrough is something I'm interested in. Um, yeah, I mean, generally the, I mean, there's, there's so much nonsense out there about batteries. Like, about, you can believe about 1% of what you read, um, on a, you know, maybe. Um, uh, Lithium-ion covers a very broad range of technologies. Um, and you can have an enormous difference in the power density and the energy density and the cycle life um, between one chemistry and another. They can be really enormously different. Um, so uh, what you really actually want to ask is what is the cathode and what is the anode? Right. Um, so in our case. That's right. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> I well, just put it in the The, the lithium is actually 2% of the cell mass. Mm -hmm. so, so it's like the salt in the salad. It's, it's a very small um, amount of the cell mass and a fairly small amount of the cost. Um, but it sounds like it's big because it's called lithium ion, but it, it, it really, like our battery should be called nickel graphite because uh, it's mostly nickel and graphite. Okay, and um, it's nickel, cobalt, aluminum, but battery, you know, little things, and graphite with a silicon oxide layer. Battery like efficiency or power, that, you know, the power that you can store in a certain uh, mass seems to be move very slowly, at least compared to, you know, we're used to Moore's law pushing. Uh, integrated circuits faster, batteries kind of are always, in our consumer devices, always lagging behind. In your, you've built this giant thing, the biggest building in the world has ever seen. It's not, it's not fully built, but yes, it's... You're building it. Pretty the big biggest chunk building is built, the so yeah, yeah. Seen, yeah. Uh, to make batteries. Your whole business depends on batteries in these cars. Have you figured out a way to do some significant uh, increase in the yield of energy from a given amount of, of space in the battery? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the energy density is increasing sort of maybe on the order of like five-ish percent per year. Um, and it doesn't sound like much, but you add that 
up over a number of years with compound interest, it ends up being quite quite a significant number. Um, and a lot of people sort of think that, oh, well, we just sort of cobbled together some um, laptop batteries and somehow made a great car. But if it was that easy, then I think we would have quite a few competitors who did the same thing. But, but it's, it's, it's really quite, quite a lot harder than that. Um, the, it, it's a cylindrical form, form factor, but the internals of the battery are quite different from what you would find in, uh, in a laptop. Um, and, uh, and, and, and will be increasingly different with the, what's built at the Gigafactory, which is highly optimized for automotive um, and, um, and with, has improved energy density. But, but mostly, it's not the energy density that's the issue, because you, know, you can buy, if you buy a Model S today, um, the range is um, around 300 miles. Um, and and that, yeah, that's quite a lot. Um, so it's pretty rare that people really need to go more than 300 miles at a time exactly. without stopping. Right. You know, um, so I don't think we really have a range issue. And we could make a 400 mile range car today. Like that wouldn't be too big of a deal. Is decreasing the cost uh, per unit of energy of the battery packs so, okay. so you can make the car affordable. That's actually the, the, the important thing. Um, so there's, and there's really two main, main dimensions along which uh, cost optimization and making something available to the national market can be achieved. One is design iteration, going through multiple versions of something, and then the other is economies of scale. Um, and you kind of need both of those, those things in order to make a compelling mass market uh, product. And you look at like cell phones and how many design iterations have we gone through with cell phones, um, and, and then and, 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 what, and look at the scale at which they're, they're made, which is enormous. Uh, and that's what enables everyone to have a supercomputer in their pocket. Um, so speaking of that, the sales, when you're talking about the sales, you have booked how many orders for? It's on the order of 400,000. 400,000. So 400, obviously, yeah, it's, it's, cons it's, consumer yeah. interest and a promise. A lot of it around you, around the idea of you and Tesla and the excitement. They're yeah, not it booking. Was, it was quite surprising, actually. I mean, I, the because um, we didn't do any advertising or there was no guerrilla marketing or anything. It was just basically like, yeah, we're going to have this webcast. There, was only, there were only about 1,000 people in the audience. Um, and um, it really caught us by surprise. But I think you know, when, when you have a product that really resonates with, with customers, the word of mouth uh, grows like wildfire. And uh, that seems to be what Yeah, it, but it's a little bit. I mean, honestly, in some groups, of, especially men in Silicon Valley, if you show up and read like a label of a peanut jar, they'd be thrilled with the situation. <laughs> So, I mean, you, a lot of this does base around you, like the idea of you and the excitement around this exciting entrepreneur. Is that, is that enough to get it to, to, to this massive company you've been hoping to, the idea of this is the Elon promise or it's the... Well, I, I think actually it's not so much, uh, I mean, I, I sort of, um, um, I, I mean, I'm not sure, I, 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 th I think I des deserve less credit than that, actually. The, the, I mean, what, what Tesla's done, and we have a phenomenal team, it's like 15,000 people at the company, um, worked super hard to create compelling products, to create great cars. Um, and we started off with the Roadster and then the Model S, and the Model S was rated you know, by Consumer Reports as the best car ever. Um, but the Model X, which you know, had some, has had some teething issues, but um, I think is now at the point where it's, it's really starting to, I think it's really, I think, qu quite sublime at this point. Um, and, uh, and, and so people look at that and say, okay, well, if Tesla's made these cars, then probably the next car they make is going to be, you know, the also, less expensive one. Also a great car. And um, yeah, it, but, you know, so it'll be a great car, but it'll be affordable. And it's like, great, okay, that sounds like something I want. Um, so this car, this next car, the price is. The it's starting at thirty-five thousand. Yeah. Okay, affordable. Okay, when it, is speaking, when that's you get to the when, point when, of, when uh, do you get to the really affordable, the way down much lower than that? Yeah, I mean it's important to point out that thirty-five thousand, particularly when factoring in the lower cost of electricity versus right. gasoline, and that the maintenance cost is much less. You don't have to have oil changes. You never need to replace your brakes mm -hmm. uh, because the, the car uses regenerative braking, so the brakes last as long as the car do uh, the car does. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically you just need to replace the tires. Like mm -hmm. that's about about all. Um, so the operational cost of the car is much lower fundamentally than, than a gasoline car. And, and so um, and, and the, I think the, the, the uh, average price for cars, uh, for gasoline cars is around 30, 32, something like that, yeah. 
Uh, I mean, there are starting prices that are lower, but, but we're in pickle pick pick options. I believe it's in the around 32 or so in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty close to the that that, that, that But that's your base price, right? I mean, the yeah, but it's that be a great may not car. be the ASP for the car. No, but it's going it's to be a great car even at 35. So it's like even if you order nothing, no options at all, it'll be great. But you're at, but you're likely to have a mix where the average car that you actually sell sells for a little more than that. Yes, probably. It's probably going to be yeah. It's probably going to be some higher number, um, but it's really important to emphasize like the, like the thirty five. If, if somebody orders the thirty five thousand dollar car, they'll be very happy. Like it's not like you need to order a bunch of options in order, without which the car is is you know not not good. That car will have autonomous for thirty five. Um, I have a. Uh, I'm going to do another Tesla event maybe at the end of the year. Um, talk more about that. And well, so you could start here. <laughs> um, it will be real big news if I start here. Um, we don't mind that. <laughs> Let me just say that we're going to do the obvious thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Got it. It's really so, obvious. So, cup, <laughs> so, <laughs> so cup holders, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> So brilliant. Let, brilliant. Th those things are nuanced. <laughs> All right, absolutely. Um, let's talk about two more things. I want to talk about AI because we've been talking about it a lot here. Um, which I want to get it clear what your thoughts are because it's mostly Elon scared of robots. I mean that kind of thing. Or what, how do you? I'm scared of robots. Um, or I, I artificial think, intelligence. Can you like clarify exactly what the issue you have now? And, and you deserve the background. We've been talking to. Uh, Jeff Bezos, yeah. Sundar Pichai. Uh, we talked to Mark Fields from Ford about it. Um, it uh, uh, yeah, the Facebook folks. Um, there certainly seems to be uh, in the I, in the tech companies a big, tremendous new drive or interest to believing there will be all competing all good. for intelligent assistance. And, and it's good. It'll make your life that. better. Make Some, your life better. Siri is going to suddenly get smart. Yeah. Microsoft's one is going to get smart. And Google is going to cream it, them all. It's largely a happy version of this. Is gonna, sometimes technology hurts you, but not as much as it helps you. That's really. Yeah. So that's, there's been a lot of conversation here about yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Um, and, yet, and you've staked out a slightly different position. So can you talk about that? Well, I mean, I think my sort of full position would re require quite a long explanation. Um, I mean, I, I am concerned about um, certain directions that AI could take that would be uh, not good for the future. The, the, I mean, it, it, I think it would be fair to say that like, not all AI futures are benign, not, not all. OK. Um, and, and so if you have something, if, 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 this, if we create some digital superintelligence that exceeds us in every way by a lot, um, it's very important that that be benign. Um, and, um, and so actually with, with, uh, with a few others, um, I created uh, OpenAI, uh, which is uh, an AI, uh, it's a nonprofit actually, it's, so there's, it's, there's no I think the governance structure here is important because um, so we want to make sure that there was not some fiduciary duty to uh, generate, um, you know, profit off of the AI technology that's developed. Um, so, uh, so we created this five one C three, but it, but I think it's, it's I think quite different from. I mean, like a lot of sort of five one C threes are, you know, they. have they don't have a high sense of urgency. Um, and like they're, they're not like, um, you know, they're not really sort of ex developing technology at, 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 a, at a fast pace. But OpenAI is. Uh, so OpenAI has a very high sense of urgency. And the town, I think that the people that have joined are, are really, really amazing. Um, um, and, um, and the intent with OpenAI is to democratize AI power. Um, and there's a quote that I love from uh, Lord Acton. He was the guy that came up with power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely, um, which is that uh, freedom consists of the distribution of power and despotism in its concentration. And so I think it's important if we have this incredible power of AI that it not be concentrated in the hands of a few and potentially lead to a world that we 
don't want. And what world is that? What, is the, what do you see, foresee that when you see it? It's difficult. I mean, it's called the singularity because it's, it's difficult to predict um, what, exactly what future that might be, except um, I don't know a lot of people who love the idea of living under a despot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think people generally choose to live in a democracy over a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And the despot would be the computer? Or the people controlling the computer. Mm -hmm. And do you worry specifically about any of these companies I mentioned who've all seemed to now be kind deep. of be pivoting toward this as the battleground in the next 10 years? I won't name a name, but there is only one. There's only one you're worried about. And they're not preoccupied with making a car that will compete with you, I assume. There's only one. <laughs> <laughs> And what, tell, tell me, this is an interesting... It's not about, it's not about competing. It's, is there, like, like, this is sort of like, like, what would be the point of competing for, you know, mutual destruction? It's like, there's no, it's not about competing. It's really just about um, trying to increase the probability that the future will be good. That's all. Mm -hmm. So the, the goal of open, of open AI is really just to take the set of actions that are most likely to improve the positive futures. Like, if you can think of like the future as a set of, of probability streams that, yep. that, that branch out and then converge, collapse down to a particular event and then branch out again. And uh, there's a certain set of probabilities associated with the future being positive and different type flavors of that. And uh, at OpenAI, we want to try to do, do whatever we can to guide to Do to you there. worry that by making this open, some bad actors may use some of what has been developed to do bad stuff uh, with the power yeah. of AI. Yeah, I mean, that, that is certainly the, 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 I mean, a good rebuttal to that. Um, however, I think if AI power is widely distributed, um, then, and there's not, uh, say, one entity that has some super AI that is a million times smarter than anything else. I mean, if, if instead the AI power is broadly distributed, and to the degree that we can link uh, AI power to um, each individual's will. Um, so, like you, you know, you would have your AI agent, and you would, like everyone would have their sort of AI agent. And then, if somebody did try to do something really terrible, well, then the collective will of others could overcome that bad actor. Um, which you can't do if, if there's one AI that's, you know, a million times better than everything and else. And it's proprietary. And it's, yeah, it's either has its own will, or more likely, at least in the beginning, is controlled by, you know, some small set of people. So, uh, I think that's that's really the the risk. I mean, um, you know, there's there's always been these arguments like, what's the what's the best form of government? Um, you know, I'm a big fan of, I think it was Churchill, like, you know, democracy is the the worst form of government except for all the others. Right. Um, so speaking and, of that, yeah. this election, you are from. Oh no. No no no. <laughs> yes yes yes. <laughs> How does that strike you, what's happening now? You're, you, you've come to this country, you're a naturalized citizen. Uh, you know, I think uh, I'm glad that the framers of the Constitution saw fit to ensure that the president uh, was someone who um, was captain of a large ship with a small rudder. Okay. And? There's a limit to how much harm any given president. Are you sure about that? Oh, yeah. 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 So you're not worried about... Are you backing in either of the candidates at this point? Try to stay out of this situation. <laughs> because? I don't think that's the finest moment in our democracy. Well, given <laughs> that it's not the finest moment in our democracy, do you think the best thing is to stay out? Or we'll see. to get in I'm not sure what, what I could to do to... head off to the worst. I mean, I'm not sure how much influence I could have as, as one person on the outcome. Um, so... Um, I mean, if I think I could make a difference, I would probably do something. Um, but um, like I said, I think I'm just glad that, that, that the pre you know, be, be, being the U.S. president is like being captain of a large ship with a small rudder. Mm -hmm. And so the, there's just a limit to how much good or bad a president can, can, can actually do. I um, mean, obviously, if, if a president could make the economy great that, and there was like a button he could press, they'd be pressing that button at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know that they, but they, they can't. Like, can't they can't just magically make the economy good? 
Um, no president wants the economy bad ever, um, but they, you know, like there's just a limit to, to how much they can do. Um, and, um, you know, I guess there is the nuclear thing, which is... Yeah, the nuclear know. thing. <laughs> I guess there is the nuclear thing. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I think people, I think, I think, I don't think we would like just arbitrarily launch nuclear missiles. Yeah. Yeah. One would hope. President can do that. Um, uh, I don't think so. President's not the commander in chief. I mean, I think that he's no, he's the commander in chief. Yeah, no, but I, 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 I still don't think that means you can just launch nuclear missiles whenever you want. Uh, yeah. Um, um, I, I think Congress would be like quite upset about that, and um, they might not be consulted. Yeah, but I think I think like the military would be like, yeah, we really think Congress should be consulted on it before you launch yeah. a. Yeah. That that might happen. Preemptive nuclear happen. strike. Are you yeah. willing? That, um, you're basing your faith in that, though. I'm quite confident that the military would not just, you know, randomly agree to launching nuclear missiles at somebody. Well, that's calming. This is yeah. um, something. So, yeah. um, uh, we're going to put up just very quickly. We'll end on Hyperloop. You've been involved with it. Your level of involvement is what at this point? Just yeah, um, I know it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit confusing because um, I. Um, you talked about it when you were here last time. Yeah, um, <laughs> I actually came up with the idea. Um, I came up with an initial idea, which, which turned out to be wrong. It wouldn't work um, several years ago, and and then, um, but I sort of shot my mouth off and, and said, oh, I feel like I have an idea that would work, and it turned out that didn't work. But I've, with a lot of iteration, was able to come up with something that where the physics hangs together, um, and then published the paper and just said, like, look, anyone who wants to do this is great. Go, you know, be my guest, because uh, I'm. I sort of have a plate full running Tesla and SpaceX. Yeah, yeah. And so I think it'd be great. I mean, it'd be great to have any interesting new transport solutions, um, anything that gets people to their destination um, in a way that's safer, costs less, is more convenient. Um, that'd be great. I mean, and so I think probably the most valuable thing that the Hyperloop paper that I published. Um, uh, has done is, is to spur thinking in terms of new transportation systems. So it's not just, oh, let's, you know, have a, a fast train. Um, okay, that's not even as fast as what Japan did in the 80s. Like, okay, well, why, well, why don't I see what the point of that is, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like, we should really be trying to think of some, something that's, um, I think particularly in California, like, we should be, like, saying, hey, what is the best, well, let's invent something new that's, way better than anything else. Do you want to shoot your mouth off about that? Um, well, um, you know, I, so, so I, I mean, I'm not an investor in any of the companies uh, that, are, that are working on it, and I've tried to be neutral, because I'm, like, try, I'm trying not to favor one company over another, uh, but just to encourage anyone that is interested to say that, you know, they ha try, try to give them moral support, you know, um, and I, I hope they succeed. Um, the, the only thing that um, I am doing on the Hyperloop Front is like we're, we're holding a student competition, mm -hmm. and the student competition is really just um, aimed towards encouraging uh, students to think about exciting new transport methods. Um, and it's totally cool if they want to like do some architecture that's different from uh, what I proposed in Hyperloop. And in fact, the the winning team at the student competition that we held earlier this year used a different um, suspension mechanism. Uh, than what I proposed, which is I, you know, I, I propose using, essentially taking taking the uh, air that eventually that builds up on the nose from the compressor and, and, and flowing that through um, air skis, um, so that you simultaneously remove the drag from the nose mm -hmm. and provide a, 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 a means of suspending the the, the pod, um, and, and that's also something that that works well. Um, even at uh, super supersonic velocities, you can go. It's been demonstrated up to Mach 1.1 in terms of using air bearings as. Mm -hmm. as but a, they use something different. Uh, uh, yeah, basically electromagnetic suspension. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, like the, the the reason I didn't suggest um, uh, um, sort of any any kind of um, um, magnetic sus suspension um, is that it's very important that the cost of the of the tube be, be minimized. So you really want, because the, 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 the pod is cheap, the tube is expensive. Um, so if you, if you want to go, say, 400 miles and you've, and, and two, in two directions, so you've got 800 miles of tube, the, the, the critical uh, e economic optimization parameter is the cost of the tube. 
So we want that tube to be as low cost as possible. Um, and so if you, if you do anything that, requ that um, requires um, action on the tube side, it's going to make that tube much more expensive. Um, so if you use air bearings, it doesn't change. Like, that's real cheap. Um, and um, yeah, so. You think this is going to happen? Yeah, I think something like that. I think something will happen in the future. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, I think I think if 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 the companies that are that are trying that are trying to make it happen now, if if for whatever reason that that doesn't work out, um, then you know I think I, I'll you know I'll I might I might do something myself in the future. I, I don't want to do something. I don't want I don't want to sort of front run them. You know, and it's like say here's this free idea, and then meanwhile I go and do it myself. You know, that wouldn't be nice. So, um, so, so but if I, if they if they if they if, if a bunch of people, if companies don't try it and it doesn't work out, then, then I think, I think, um, I think I'll try to just at least do a demonstration system. Yeah. Okay. Last question: Do you think tech has gotten more serious? Do you, how do you look at the tech landscape as someone who's you know well known? You probably qualify as a visionary. Um, the concept: what, Where do you imagine we are right now in the tech space? And then we'll get to questions from the audience. I think there's a lot of innovation happening. In, in many different areas, um, the advancements in AI are, I think are quite quite astonishing. Um, the advancements in genetics are amazing. Um, they, so I, I think that there is a lot of innovation going on. Um, I think that there's probably a few too many talented entrepreneurs in kind of the internet space and and I think their talent actually would be better served in some other industries. Um, but I do think, that, I mean, I don't think we're like facing some sort of low innovation period or anything like that. I think there's a lot of innovation going on. They need to move to other. Uh, I just think there's like, if you had some ideal distribution, it would probably really be fewer, like there's just a lot of talent focused on the internet and probably some of that talent um, uh, would um, be, be it would be better to have some of that talent in other industries. Um, that, that's about all. But, but there's a tr tremendous amount of innovation that, that's happening. Um, it's something that I think is, is going to be quite important. Um, and and, and it's, there's not, I don't know of a company that's working on it seriously is, um, is a neural lace. Um, so. Okay, going, going back to the AI situation, um, like this is quite an important, uh, quite an important debate. Like the, if you assume any rate of advancement in AI, um, we will be left behind by a lot, um, and so then we could be in, like, you know, benign situation. But the, even the benign situation, if you have some, you know, if you have ultra intelligent AI, um, we would be, you know. So, so far below them in intelligence that it would be, would be like, you know, a pet. Basically. A pet. That's what I was thinking. Like a pet. Cat. Like a cat. Like a cat. Like a cat. It would be like a house cat. cat. Yeah, right. it would be like the house cat. Right. Um, and um, yeah, it's not, that's it's not the end of the world. You know, it's just, you well, know sort of pet. You've seen the movie. It could be. Yeah. It could be. It could be. Um, the, you know, so that, but that honestly, that, that would that would be the benign scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and so, house cat is okay. I mean, I don't love the idea of being a house cat. Okay. Um, but, but that, so what's the solution? Yeah, so I think the, um, I, I, think, I, think it, I think it's to essentially, I think one of the solutions, the solution that, that seems maybe the best one is to have an AI layer. Um, if you think of like you've got your limbic system, um, your cortex, and then um, a digital layer, a sort of a third layer above the cortex, um, that um, could work work well and symbiotically with with you. I mean, just as your cortex works symbi symbiotically with your limbic system, your sort of a third digital layer could work symbiotically with the rest. This of is you. something that's in, in surgically inserted or bred so, into the species, or what? The, the fundamental limitation is input output. So uh, we, we already have uh, we, we're already a cyborg. 
Um, it's just that, I mean, you have a digital version of yourself or, or partial version of yourself online in the form of your emails and your social media and all the things that you do. Um, and, and you have basically superpowers in, in that with your computer and your phone and, and the applications that are there. Um, you have more power than the President of the United States had 20 years ago. Like you can answer any question. Uh, you can video conference with anyone um, right. anywhere. You can send a message to millions of people instantly. Um, you know, you just do incredible things. And, um, but the constraint is, is input out, output. So we're, we're IO bound, um, particularly output bound. I mean, like the, your output level is so low. It's like, particularly on a phone, like your two thumbs are sort of tapping away. Our input is much better because we have a high bandwidth visual interface to the brain. Like our, our eyes take in a lot of, a lot of data. Um, so there's many orders of magnitude difference between um, input and output. Um, so mostly, um, effectively merging in a symbiotic way with uh, digital intelligence revolves around eliminating the I.O. constraint. Um, so it would be some sort of direct cortical interface. Um, and you called it a neural lace. Neur neural lace, yeah. Um, it's totally not Google Glass, right? No, I, I'm talking about no, something which. No, but it's which, like you wear it. Or you... No, I mean it would be. Uh, I mean, it, I mean there are a few ways to approach this, but some sort of interface directly with your cortical neurons, particularly. But doesn't that imply uh, surgical insertion? Not necessarily. You could go through the veins and arteries because that, that provides a, a complete uh, roadway to um, all of your neurons. Your neurons are very heavy users of energy, so they need high blood flow. So you automatically, with your veins and arteries, have um, a road network to your neurons. Still so, some kind of surgery, right? Um, yes, but it, you could insert something, you know, basically, you know, in, in, into the jugular and, and have... <laughs> It gets macabre, but it sounds I mean, really easy and it, it doesn't involve skull or anything like that. That's yeah. good. Yeah. But, and plus, you're not a house cat anymore, right? Not a house cat. So, right. um, I mean, essentially, if, if we can figure out how to establish a high bandwidth neural interface with ourselves, with with your digital self, effectively, um, then uh, then you're no longer a house cat. You know. All right. On and, that and, note, no. On that. Note. Wait, wait, wait. I, just one closing thing. I mean, I think that's probably. Are you? In, are outcome. you interested? That's probably the best outcome, I think. Are you interested in exploring this possibility that you have just laid? So, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> I'm not saying that I will, but I'm, somebody's got to do it. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, so, somebody should do it. And I mean, if somebody doesn't do it, then I, then I think I should probably do it. But. Uh, <laughs> And, and the goal of this is to prevent there being an external uh, AI, particularly one controlled by a small group of people that could yeah. be so much more powerful and intelligent than we are that the house would be, be godlike in situation. In yeah. Well, okay. this has been really cheerful. Thank you. Yeah. But, but, if, but if we can establish... I was worried about asteroids <laughs> at the beginning of this. I mean, ast asteroids are a low probability uh, existential threat um, on the time scale that's relevant to us. Okay. Okay. Um, this is different. This requires urgency. So, what do you do for fun? Yes, this is much Elon, more. Elon, what do you do for fun? Fun. What do you do? Anything? I play video games with my kids. All right, that sounds good. Let's get some questions. <laughs> Elon. Elon the house cat. I watch movies. Yeah, right. kind of thing. Normal thing. Uh, why don't we start over here? Yeah. Hi. I, I think this last question by uh, Carl just just did that. Uh, I want to know how do you uh, live through the stress that kind of conversations we just heard that you went through and uh, kind of ambitions that you carry and then how do you adjust to the everyday work life balance etc things that in your life so a little bit of your personal side actually so you're very busy how does that work yeah i mean it, um, i am sort of in kind of work triage mode um, a lot of the time so i don't know it seems to be uh, as long as there's not like a crisis simultaneously at spacex and tesla it's okay um, but you know, companies are. I mean, 
the situation in any given company, particularly one, you know, if, if it's sort of growing fast and sort of quasi startup, it's it's somewhat sinusoidal. So that, I mean, it's okay if if you don't if the if the waves don't crest together, you know. Um, when that does happen, it, then that's a huge strain. Um, but right now, things are like you know motoring along okay, um, and I have like the context loaded for both companies, and I can look sort of see a path to a good outcome. So I feel pretty good right now. Uh, but there've been super stressful times in the past, um, and uh, and then you know and then I, I always try to reserve time for my kids because I love hanging out with them like. I mean, kids are really great. I mean, they're like the 99% um, of the time they're, 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 they make you happier. Their kids are awesome. You know? Yeah. Um, then there's that 1%. 1%, you know, like, yeah, 1%. But, but like, it's, it's like of anything in my life, I would say kids by far make me the happiest. I, mean, I don't know if, you know. I agree. Yeah, I it's agree. great. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so hang out with them, like so, like no, the, the, like things like a lot of times kids are kind of in their own world, so you don't need to like they don't want to like talk to their dad for hours on end generally. I've noticed that. Yeah. Um, so like, um, so I can be in the same room with them. They can talk to me from time to time, but like you know, I can get you know some emails done, just get some work done, and then whenever they want to talk to me, they can. Um, and then uh, we uh, we try to do things like um, you know. Tr tr together or uh, um, actually on Monday we went to the new Harry Potter land um, at cool. Universal it was quite fun mm -hmm. yeah so <laughs> the, I think that the, somebody from Universal yeah. just clapped yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, whoever was in charge of Harry Potter land did a great job it's really good yeah it's good I highly recommend it yeah, yeah. the butter beer is amazing yeah I was just saying the butter, the, <laughs> the butter, the butter beer butter is amazing beer. yeah okay right here. over here Hi, uh, my name is Evan Burns. I'm the founder of Odyssey, and I hope into the future to be in something in the space industry. And my curiosity is, you've talked about SpaceX getting in many different businesses, for example, um, global Wi-Fi through launching many satellites. Um, do you hope SpaceX becomes a platform for others to launch businesses, or do you see SpaceX being a business that launches many business lines? Um, well, I mean, the general our strategy of SpaceX is to, like, we, we clearly need a lot of money in order to develop the transport system to establish a city on Mars. Um, so, you know, we, we're, like, kind of gathering revenue, uh, like, uh, Earth-based revenue that's, um, <laughs> we're, 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 we're trying to maximize is there Earth, some other Earth revenue. revenue. Well, right now it's only Earth, so we've got to maximize Earth revenue as it relates to space, you know, as it relates to rockets and spacecraft. So, um, but I think, like, what, assuming SpaceX is able to transport large numbers of people and, and goods to Mars, it will be an enormous enabler for entrepreneurial activity on Mars, um, because there's going to be so much to do. Um, you know, everything from creating like the first iron ore refinery to the first pizza joint to, um, you know, it was something that doesn't even exist on Earth. Um, you know, it's kind of like when the Union Pacific uh, crossed, crossed, you know, and like everybody thought, Union you know, Pacific, what a stupid idea. <laughs> you know, like there's nobody living in California. <laughs> you know, well, okay, now there's quite a lot of people living in California. Um, so, so just uh, having, it, you need the transport link. Um, and so what SpaceX is trying to do is, is establish a transport link um, and then try to create a fertile environment for entrepreneurs on Mars uh, to flourish. Um, and, and I think that will be an, an amazing um, expansion of entrepreneurial. How long would it take to deliver a pizza from Mars? <laughs> well, it's going to be a little cold, I think. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, we, 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 we can certainly see a way to get to Mars in under three months. Um, and I think ultimately you'll be able to get to Mars in under a month. It does get exponentially difficult as you reduce the time. Um, but, um, but, you know, th three months is a, is a way to think okay. of it. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, that's, that's really where, where SpaceX will, I think, create a, a great environment for entrepreneurial potential. Yeah. Thanks. Neil? I yeah, hope hi. Domino's does not get to Mars. <laughs> Please don't let it. We'll have a special, uh, special Mars pizza. I assume you're going to be, I'm assuming hey, you're hey, going to be king of Mars. Be luck. Uh, uh, so you're obviously very ambitious. Um, that's led to some really ambitious deadlines that have been missed. So Falcon Heavy was originally 2012. Um, the Model X was a little bit delayed. The Model 3, the Model X was delayed. The Model 3 seems to be stretching. But the Model 3 in particular is a consumer product 
you're taking money from people against a really aggressive production schedule and a huge amount of orders, what are you going to do to hit your deadlines on that because it's real consumers this time and a big class of people? Sure. Um, the, uh, I, I think the, the biggest thing is just designing the car for, um, for, for manufacturing. So in the case of Model S, like Model S was the first time we'd really built a car. Uh, a whole car. Like with the Roadster, Lotus did the body and chassis, we did the powertrain, and then we did the sort of final installation of the powertrain to the, to the chassis. But the Model S was the first time we made a car. So we were just trying to make a, a great car, um, and, but we had no idea like what it meant to design something to be manufacturable. So the Model S is super hard to make, and then the Model X is built off of the Model S platform, except it's got a bunch of other whiz-bang technologies that make it even harder to build. So. Um, and, uh, you know, so, um, like, that, I mean, definitely we want to do the opposite of what we do with the, with the X, um, which is make something that is, is going to be a lot simpler, um, but still a car that people will love, um, and where every design decision is factoring in the manufacturability, uh, in factor, and, and making sure that when we design something, um, that you can manufacture it at volume, at an affordable price, uh, in the schedule that we're, that we're on the schedule that we're, that we're targeting. Um, one of the things that makes a car very difficult, particularly if it's a new car, uh, is is that it's an integrated product with several mercy of whatever the slowest component is, whatever basically. I mean, if you say go to tier two and th three suppliers, they end up being several thousand suppliers. So, so things move as fast as the least lucky and least competent supplier. Um, you know, but, but just, and you can think of like, like any natural disaster you care to name, all of those things have happened to our suppliers. The factory has burnt down, there's been an earthquake, there's been a you know, tsunami, there's been uh, massive hail, uh, there's been a tornado, uh, the ship sank, uh, there was a shootout at the Mexican border, um, no kidding. Um, that, that delayed trunk carpet at one point. Well, like, and we couldn't get, and like, the, and like the Border Patrol wouldn't give us the truck because it had like, bullet holes in it. Um, we just wanted our trunk carpet. Um, like it's pretty safe. <laughs> so it's like no cocaine or anything. This is good. <laughs> um, but you know, that shut down the production line as an example for several days. Um, so, so there's, that's the biggest issue is like the supply chain stuff is really tricky. Um, and we're trying to anticipate as much of that as possible, um, increase our optionality so that there's more internal capability at Tesla. Not that we want to do things internally, but if, um, if a supplier is unable or un unwilling to uh, deliver the part, we can quickly make that internally. Um, so I think the whole company is, is geared, geared for that. Um, and um, I mean, right now it looks like you know we should be able to do that. Uh, we expect to. I mean, we, we, almost all of the Model Three design is done, um, and we're aiming for pencils down basically uh, in about six weeks. Complete pencils down, um, and um, and we're tabling all. You know, like if there are ideas for future cool things, we'll, we'll have it in version two, version three, you know, future years type of thing. So um, overall, I feel, feel pretty good about it. Um, and um, our supply, um, particularly our major supplier partners have been um, very supportive and are on board. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I mean, I, one thing I, I should say is like the, like when, when I when I sort of cite a schedule, it is actually the schedule I think is true. It's it's not some fake schedule that I don't think is true. Um, so I mean, uh, you know, it's never you know I, it's um, I may be delusional. That is entirely you know possible. And maybe it's happened from time to time, um, but it's 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 never um, you know some knowingly fake deadline ever. So is there an event in six weeks where you're going to announce autonomous driving is included in the pencil down plan for the Model 3? <laughs> We're not expecting any event in six weeks. All right. uh, Josh. Hi. Um, 
I, so I have a, this is a kind of a weird question. I feel like you would be the guy with the right answer for it. There's a um, sort of a philosophic concept that a sufficiently advanced civilization will be able to create uh, so a simulation. simulation. Yeah, maybe you've answered this before. A simulation. I've had so many simulation discussions. It's crazy. Okay. Um, so because because in fact it, it got to the point where basically every conversation was was the AI AI slash simulation conversation. Um, and my brother and I finally agreed that um, we would ban such conversations if we were ever in a hot tub. Okay. That was like, because <laughs> you know, that really well, kills the magic. We're in a hot tub, um, so, so, so the idea is right. Any sufficiently advanced civilization would create, could create a simulation that's like our existence. And so the theory follows that may, maybe we're in the simulation. Have you thought about this? And a lot. Are we? <laughs> Are we even I, in hot tub? No, so are much so it had to be banned from a hot tub. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's not the sexiest conversation. Are we in? Are we in? Um, yeah. the, the, the I mean, I think here's in my mind like the, the, the strongest argument for the for us being in a simulation, probably being in a simulation, I think is the following um, that that 40 called 40, 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That right. was what games were. Um, now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. Mm -hmm. And soon we'll have virtu you know, virtual reality, we'll have augmented reality. Um, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. Just in they'll be indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. um, e even if that rate of advancement drops by a thousand from what it is right now. Um, then you just say, okay, well, we'll let's imagine it's a 10,000 years in the future, uh, which is nothing in the evolutionary scale. Um, so, um, so, so given that we're clearly on a trajectory to have games that are indistinguishable from reality, and those games could be played on any set-top box or on a PC or whatever, and there would probably be, you know, billions of such, uh, you know, computers or set-top boxes, it would seem to follow that the... So Tell me the, what's wrong with that argument. Is the answer yes? <laughs> the argument is probably... I mean, but I just like, is there, is there a flaw in that argument? I mean, someone... But someone I'm not that, sure what but, the error... In, right, no, no, the argument makes sense. So the assumption then is that somebody beat us to it, and this is a game. No, no, there's a one in billions chance that this is base reality. Oh, okay. What do you think? Well, I think it's one in billions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, this, this, that seems to be like clearly what the you know what the, what it, what it suggests. Right. And and actually, I mean, arguably, we should hope that that's true, because otherwise, if if civilization stops advancing, then that may be due to some calamitous event that erases civilization. So maybe we should be hopeful that this is a simulation because. Otherwise, because they could reboot it. Well, otherwise, e either we're going to create simulations that are indistingu indistinguishable from reality, or civilization will cease to exist. Those are the two options. Yeah. I like those odds. <laughs> okay. Over yeah. there. Or going right. to—it's it's unlikely to go into some like, you know, multi-million-year stasis. So it's either going to increase or decrease. Hi, I'm G2 Patel from Box. Uh, Two-part question for you. One is. Um, if you think about fully autonomous vehicles, um, which have passed through regulatory approvals, have passed through in-city driving and traffic conditions, how far do you think from a time frame perspective we are for that, hap that becoming reality? And number two would be the second part of that question is, how far before, how long before you think it's either illegal or extremely prohibitively expensive for humans to drive on the road? Well, I, I mean, I think, I mean, I really would consider autonomous driving to be basically a solved problem. Um, Even in cities like Beijing and... Yeah, yeah. Actually, it is, uh, the, there's really only one um, area where it's like a little dodgy, and that's basically if you're at roughly the 30, 30 to 40 miles an hour um, in, uh, in urban environments, which is, that's difficult to achieve in Beijing. Um, it's like heavy traffic. 
Um, in, in, in dense traffic situations, autonomy is really easy because um, you can just maintain a set distance from various cars. It's actually quite, quite easy. Um, you're un very unlikely to, dr to run anyone over because you're just not moving fast enough and you can brake in time. Um, on highways, particularly highways that, are, um, that, that have barriers so that you, you don't have pedestrians, that's also relatively easy. And uh, like a Model S and Model X at this point uh, can drive autonomously with greater safety than a person. Right now. Yeah. Um, my, my point is, when does it get to be where you don't need to be sitting behind a vehicle and it actually, the, the way that society starts expecting this is, I can have my 75-year-old mother who doesn't speak any English or doesn't drive um, be able to be transported from point A to point B by just sitting in a car by herself and being taken. I know it's technically possible, but how far do you think the regulatory approvals are for that happening? I, I think we're basically... Um, less than two years away from complete autonomy. Wow. wow. Complete. Wow. Safer than a human. Um, however, regulators will take, um, I think, at least another year, at least another year, and because it's going to depend on which, what part of the world you're in, um, because they will want to see billions of miles of data to show that it is statistically true that there is a substantial improvement in safety if something's autonomous versus not autonomous. I don't think that regulators will accept something that's close to, that's, that's, that's sort of approximately as good as a person. I think they'll have to be at least twice as good as a person, maybe five or ten times um, you know, better in terms of uh, safety. Um, and, and, and that will have to, be, have to be a statistically relevant data set. So like billions of miles over widely differing uh, roads and, and situations. Um, so, yeah, you know, so I think it's like probably three years before it's re from a regulatory standpoint, but less than two before it is uh, technically possible. And do you think there's a day when it's illegal to drive for humans or, um, you know? Well, I mean, we live in a democracy, so it's presumably that would be a function of the population deciding. Um, I, mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm not in favor of banning people from driving cars. Um, like, I'm in favor of freedom um, and, and not restricting what people do. Um, yeah. But maybe the requirements for a license will get more stringent. I think that seems like maybe a good move, you know, so you have to demonstrate a higher level of skill to drive in order to be allowed to manually drive. Okay, very last Thank question. You. This is the last make question. Make it a good one. Sorry, we, the, Elon's Because Elon go. has to go. Going to make it a great question. Uh, Thinking about life on Mars again, how do you how do you think about cultural unification, systems of government, uh, rules of law, establishing those uh, very early on? Well, I think I was just declared king of Mars a moment ago. Yeah, um, I like so, that. Yeah, take it. Yeah, thank Run. you, thank you, thank you. Um, so the the uh, I think most likely the form of government on Mars would be a direct direct democracy. Um, not representative, so it would be people voting directly on, on issues. Um, and I think that's probably better because like, the potential for corruption is substantially diminished in a direct versus a representative democracy. Um, so I think that's probably what will occur. Um, the, I, I think there's some, I think some, I would recommend like some adjustment for the inertia of laws is, would, would be wise in that it should probably be easier to remove a law than create one. Um, I think, you know, this is, I would just be like, let's just, more, I mean, I think, I think that's probably, probably good because just laws, laws are, have infinite life unless they're taken away. Um, so I think I mean, my recommendation would be like, like something like, let's say, 60% of people need to uh, vote in a law, but at any point greater than 40% of people can remove it. Um, and any law should come with a sunset, with a built-in sunset provision. If it's not good enough to be voted back in, maybe it's for the government on Mars. I mean, that would be my, those would be my recommendations. A direct, direct democracy where, where it's slightly harder to, in, to, to put laws in place than to take them away and where laws don't just automatically live forever. You'll be a good king. Thank you, <laughs> Elon Musk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank All right, nightcap. Nightcap, and tomorrow we have Devin Waving, Sean Rad, Nick Denton, and our panel, Mistakes Were Made panel, and John Podesta. So I'm sorry if we've had too much content today. We have even more tomorrow. Have some drinks. Thank you. All right. Good night. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.